Good morning, and thank you for joining me on the Path to Liberty. I'm Michael Bolden with the Tenth Amendment Center, and this is the Fast Friday edition of the show for July 15th, 2022. And on this episode, I've got some seriously ignored or maybe just hidden history behind the 13th Amendment to abolish slavery. What most people seem to not know, or maybe in some cases they don't want you to know, is that the primary text of the amendment, section one of the 13th Amendment, was intentionally copied from text drafted originally by Thomas Jefferson for a proposal back in 1784. I'm going to get to all that in just a moment. But first of all, a quick hello and a huge thank you for being here. I really appreciate it, whether this is your first episode or you've been here for every single one since day one. But since it's Fast Friday, I promise to not take up too much of your time. Let's see if I can get this out to you in the next 15-ish minutes. And I should point out that if you want to follow along with uh, the stuff that I mentioned in this episode, I've got a show link section uh, that will go with this episode. I publish a blog post for every episode of what one to two hours after the live stream is done. You can find that over at 10th Amendment Center dot com slash path to liberty. It's all spelled out. 10th Amendment Center dot com slash path to liberty. And let's start out with Jefferson's Monticello.org, which a couple of years ago uh, put out a press release, a couple, it's like six years now, about displaying an original copy, the original copy of the 13th Amendment. And they said the 13th Amendment signed by President Abraham Lincoln, which is an interesting story in and of itself, in 1865, abolished slavery and outlawed involuntary servitude. It declared that, quote, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. Interesting. Now, that story about signing by Abraham Lincoln, there is some story to that. Here from the California African American Museum, which has some really interesting history on this, they point out that the President of the United States has no formal role in the amendment process under the Constitution. They are correct. At this, all the same, the January 31st resolution was sent to Lincoln, and he added his name to it along with the word approved. Fascinating. On February 1st, 1865. This small gesture by Lincoln, like many of his actions, was cause for legislative consternation. So on February 7th, Congress would pass a resolution restating that the president had no role in the amendment process and that his signature was unnecessary. This makes the 13th the only ratified amendment signed by a president. It's interesting that Monticello says nothing about that. They also say nothing about where the idea for the amendment came from. Uh, but here at CAAM, they say the 13th grew from Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation on January 1st, 1863, which proclaimed that slaves in the U.S. states then in rebellion were free. Hmm. So if we're taking all this kind of into consideration, between Lincoln's signature on the document and then the claim that the whole process came from the Emancipation Proclamation, it's as if there's no one else to consider. We don't need to go back before 1863, really, if we want to understand who came up with the 13th Amendment. But that's absolute nonsense. And to start looking at that a little closer, here's Thomas Jefferson. This was his proposal for the Territorial Governance Act of 1784 under the Articles of Confederation when he had a very brief stint in the Confederation Congress. And this is what he wanted to do with the new territories. After the year 1800 of the Christian era, there shall be neither slavery nor involuntary servitude in any of the said states, otherwise than in punishment of crimes, whereof the party shall have been duly convicted to have been personally guilty. Hmm, interesting. Very, very similar approach there from Jefferson, almost copied verbatim in Section 1 of the 13th Amendment. Now, this would have barred slavery from all the Western territories. There's a, a revision to this uh, language on March 22nd, I believe. But it would have the proposal was to ban slavery in all Western territories after the year 1800. The act itself passed, but Jefferson's anti-slavery plank actually failed by a single vote. And he wrote about that a couple of years later in 1786. Well, I'm not sure if this was 1786, somewhere, maybe another year later. There were 10 states present, he wrote. Six voted unanimously for it. 
three against it, and one was divided. And seven states, seven votes being requisite to decide the proposition affirmatively, it was lost. Jefferson lamented this way. He said, the voice of a single individual of the state which was divided or of one of those which were of the negative would have prevented this abominable crime from spreading itself over the new country. Thus, he wrote, we see the fate of millions unborn hanging on the tongue of one man. And heaven was silent in that awful moment, exclamation point, highlighting that. But he continued, there's still some hope. He wanted to see this change, but it is to be hoped it will not always be silent and that the friends to the rights of human nature, talking about this being a natural right to live free, right? Which is interesting if you consider the hypocrisy in his personal life, but that's not the conversation we're having today. I just want to mention that briefly, but point out this is hidden history that most people never learn. The friends to the rights of human nature will in the end prevail. And on 16th of March, 1785, it was moved in Congress that the same proposition should get another consideration. He said it was uh, got eight votes to three. So it was able to be referred to committee to be considered further. So it was getting a second shot just a couple of years later. And it did actually get incorporated uh, not exactly the same, but very similar. The first part as Article six of the Northwest Ordinance of 1787, which starts out very similar. There shall be neither slavery nor involuntary servitude in the said territory. Otherwise, than in the punishment of crimes whereof the party shall have been duly convicted. This is an ordinance for the government of the territory of the United States northwest of the river Ohio. That's the official name. So unlike that ordinance's famous anti-slavery clause. It was well known throughout the early period of the Republic. Jefferson's defeated provision in 1784 would have applied south as well as north of the Ohio River. And not only did the, the Northwest Ordinance version water it down by just uh, narrowing the, the region, but it also added a fugitive slave clause. So even though it was highly respected, it wasn't nearly as strong as the Jeffersonian version. Anyways, provided always her is his original version provided always that any person escaping into the same from whom labor or service is lawfully claimed in any one of the original States, such fugitive may be lawfully reclaimed and conveyed to the person claiming his or her labor or service as aforesaid. That's the fugitive slave clause in article six. Now, if you go to the Wikipedia page, and this is kind of just a quick aside, I wanted to include this because there is, this is a hidden history. The Wikipedia page for Northwest Ordinance, you can find Jefferson's name on there five or six times, but not once regarding the anti-slavery text in Article 6 or anything that he wrote, the precursor that they actually included in from 1784. So if you go and you read this section, Prohibition on Slavery, it includes Article 6, and then they follow it up with this. At the time, no one claimed being responsible for this article. Sometime later, Nathan Dane of Massachusetts claimed he wrote it, and Manasseh Cutler told his son Ephraim he wrote it. But we know that isn't the case. And Wikipedia makes no correction to point out that the text actually came from Jefferson. It's as if it never happened. It's just magical. We don't really know. And that's just hidden history. And But, you know, if you think about it, today... In the age of information, Wikipedia has no clue who drafted that text in the Northwest Ordinance. But more than a century before the Internet, the Free Soil Party was able to learn history and the details about it. And this was from their platform of 1848, resolved that the proviso of Jefferson to prohibit the existence of slavery after 1800 in all the territories of the United States, Southern and Northern, the votes of six states and 16 delegates in the Congress of 1784 in favor to three states and seven delegates against the actual exclusion of slavery from the Northwestern Territory by the Ordinance of 1787 adopted unanimously clearly show that it was the settled policy of the nation not to extend, nationalize or encourage, but to limit, localize and discourage slavery 
And to this policy, which should have never been departed from, the government ought to return. So the Free Soil Party in 1848 was much more capable of understanding the history behind this anti-slavery provision of 1787 and the history from 1784 than even Wikipedia today. Now, jumping forward to the debate over the 13th Amendment, here from Kurt Lashes, the original meaning of the 13th. He notes that on January 11th, 1864, Missouri Senator John Brooks Henderson introduced a proposed abolition amendment, which was submitted to the Senate Judiciary Committee. The uh, few weeks later, they reported its consideration. And then on March 28th, the chair of the Judiciary Committee, which was Lyman Trumbull, submitted the following joint resolution as originally introduced by Mr. Henderson. And it's very familiar. Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for crime, whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place sub subject to their jurisdiction. The committee, Lash writes, based its draft on Jefferson's language in the Northwest Ordinance. We can also say that they based it on 1784. They generally referred to the Northwest Ordinance uh, rather than 1784 in those debates, but it was very clear at the time that it came from Jefferson. It wasn't from Lincoln. It wasn't the Emancipation Proclamation, even if that had other, uh, if that actually pushed people to do things, maybe that's the argument you could make, but the 13th Amendment, actually the text of it came from Jefferson. And here again from Kurt Lash, he said, the narrow scope of the proposed amendment raised objections from the radicals, like Charles Sumner, who appreciated that the proposed draft was based on, and this is in Sumner's term, the radical abolitionist, the old Jeffersonian ordinance, sacred in our history. So the radical abolitionist Sumner recognized where this came from. Yet today, we have no idea, right? Sumner, Lash writes, preferred a broader amendment that would go beyond prohibition of chattel slavery and guarantee that all persons are equal before the law so that no person can hold another as a slave. And this was actually lifted from the French, and there was a debate between Sumner, Lyman Trumbull, and Jacob Howard, and they rejected his approach because, well, they thought this was going to be a better way forward. Even Michael Vorenberg's book, Final Freedom, which I do recommend, pointed out that the Jeffersonian label stuck to the amendment throughout the congressional debates. This was just well known at the time. And people who disagree with us on original legal meaning of the Constitution all the time, scholars like Jack Balkin and Sanford Levinson point out here that proponents of the amendment routinely referred to it as incorporating the language of the Jeffersonian ordinance. And of course, because they don't like Jeffersonian uh, principles of government, they want to downplay that. And they say, well, they just wanted to use that because his name held weight with some people who were on the fence and this way they could get the thing passed. And maybe that was part of it. But Howard himself actually had something else to say. And according to him, this historical language was well understood by the public, so there could be no confusion. Here in his own words, the language is well understood, well comprehended by the people of the United States, and that no court of justice, no magistrate, no person, old or young, can misapprehend the meaning and effect of that clear, brief, and comprehensive clause. So they went with the Jeffersonian ordinance because everyone was familiar with it. It was a very popular one as well. Here's Thomas Jefferson in a letter replying to James Heaton. This is, I think, 44 or 45 days before Jefferson passed away, May 20th, 1826. Uh, Heaton had asked Jefferson to write in favor of the abolition of slavery. And here's how Jefferson put it. The revolution in public opinion, which this case requires, is not to be expected in a day or perhaps in an age, but time, which outlives all things, will outlive this evil also. My sentiments have been 40 years before the public. So he's actually referencing his ordinance of 1784, the, the part that didn't get passed. My sentiments have been 40 years before the public. Had I repeated them 40 times, they would only have become the more stale and threadbare. Although I shall not live to see them consummated, they will not die with me. But living or dying, 
they will ever be in my most fervent prayers. So that's Jefferson on May 20th, 1826, shortly before he passed away. And this from William Merkel, uh, a paper published in the Seton Hall Law Review, I think sums it up really well. The failed anti-slavery provision of 1784 is perhaps one of the most significant legislative clauses that never was. Quite apart from questions respecting its likely effects on the future spread of slavery if it had taken effect, the provision established an important milestone in the history of anti-slavery constitutionalism in the United States, marking out the first attempt to write free soil provisions into a national constitutional instrument. Well, I hope this hidden history lesson was interesting. I hope it was educational, more important than anything. I hope you learned something. I can't thank you enough for spending some of your time with me today. If you support us getting this kind of info out to more and more people, nothing helps us get that job done more than the financial faith and support of our members. You can join us for as little as two bucks a month over at 10thamendmentcenter.com slash members. Again, 10thamendmentcenter.com slash members. Again, thank you so much for being here. I hope you enjoyed the episode. I hope you have a great weekend, and I'll see you next week here on the Path to Liberty.